Welcome to the fourth and final installment of the Humanity Center Tuesday Lecture Series, Care for Our Common Home, Environmental Justice, and Sustainability Across Disciplines. I'm Hannah Holtzman, the Keck Postdoctoral Fellow in the Humanity Center and organizer of this series. And I just want to extend thanks for this four-week series to Noel, Brian, and Lindy, all of the support from the Humanity Center, um, as well as to Michelle Boudrias, who helped conceive of this series last spring, and Trey McDonald in the Sustainability Office, who has offered some resources here at USD, which we can look at at the end of the presentations today. So each week we focused on a particular theme related to environmental justice and sustainability with speakers from the arts, humanities, sciences, and social sciences for a real multidisciplinary liberal arts approach to the climate crisis and the urgent challenges that it poses for humanity and for the planet. And sort of as a side note, yesterday we had a really fun workshop on um, cross-stitch and extinction. So that was a, a neat opportunity to kind of explore these issues as creators ourselves. So our final session today on extinction, broadly considered, um, features two guest speakers who generously agreed to join us and share their work. Jeffrey Stuker, visual artist and filmmaker, um, and Ursula Heise from the UCLA Department of English and Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. So um, we'll start with Jeffrey Stuker. So it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our first presenter, Jeffrey Stuker, who's a visual artist and filmmaker whose work has been shown internationally from New York and Los Angeles to London, Paris, and Berlin. Stuker received an MFA from Yale University where he also taught for several years. And he is currently co-editor of the journal Effects and director of the Sealed Library. His artistic practice is concerned with the synthetic characteristics of seemingly organic processes, which he can tell us more about, um, with a particular focus on mimicry, which is sort of the focus of the talk today. And the short films that he's grac graciously agreed to screen today um, include Mimicry and the Monte Carlo Predator, which was exhibited at Garden Gallery in Los Angeles in early 2019 and was described in Art Forum as, quote, a meditation on the fate of natural history in our current stage of technological reproduction. Work related to this talk is slated to open later this month as part of the Hammer Biennial Made in LA 2020. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share my work with you at USD and with everyone who's joining us today. Um, as Hannah mentioned, I have two short films to share with you today. Uh, both of which are 10 minutes, and I'll share the films after brief introductions, and then I'll, we'll have plenty of time afterwards, and after Ursula gives her what looks to be a very exciting talk, uh, we'll, we'll have an open period for questions and uh, conversation about my films. So I won't say too much now. I will say that the first film is about this incredible insect, which we see in all throughout uh, the southern hemisphere and especially in the tropics and in places in the new world and it's called the Fulgora Latinaria. This is a, quite a curious creature. This is with its wings outstretched and this is with its false head, this mighty protuberance which it grows atop its abdomen and this is an empty head. There's no organs in here and no food comes through here. And these teeth, which look quite frightening as you see them here, are fictional incisors. They're almost painted through the process of evolutionary mimicry. This is an example of mimicry gone out of control. That's not a Darwinistic phrase by any stretch of the imagination. And sadly, we don't have a lot of writings on mimicry from Darwin, but rather from his successors, uh, Bates and uh, Fritz Muller in particular. But no one has so far been able to account for this preponderance of mimetic adaptations that the Fulgora Latinaria has engaged in on its body. Uh, one a 20th century French thinker, notably Roger Caillois, has stated that in this form of mimicry, the insect risks going extinct because the mimicry no longer serves any kind of a protective function. It's a kind of, and this is a very strange uh, expression for Kaiwa to use, it's a kind of 
suicide by mimicry. This bug makes itself more vulnerable because it's engaged in every possible fireworks of aesthetic production on its body, and it no longer blends in. It just looks like a small monster, a tiny alligator head, like a Halloween mask on top of a beetle's body with big butterfly wings. It can barely fly. That's a great example of, of, a, of a mimicry taking over and, and ultimately functioning as a kind of encumbrance rather than a protection. So with no further ado, I'd like to share with you this film, which hopefully you have some sense of um, in both the comedy and the tragedy of, of mimicry in this uh, insect. And, and that is the spirit that I wrote the voiceover narrative for, which is included in this book, which also at one time came with the postcard that I just showed with you, shared with you. To script turned in on itself, one author likens the superior wings of this insect. To likens another, growing over scars in the bark of the Simaruba tree. Along the abdomen, you will notice wax secreted from the fulgora's anus, the white filaments of which crust in contact with the air. These excrescences hide the abdomen and tail, helping the insect to blend with the bark of the simaruba. Generally left uncovered by the white wax, the thorax emerges from behind the camouflage of its upper wings. Perhaps you see the lizard perched atop the gecko, gazing retinalessly back at you. Ocelli on wings inferior only in name. Two giant eyes spread out suddenly at the moment of danger. They captivate potential captors. <laughs> 
In the eyes of a man of French letters, an alligator mask. In the eyes of Amazonian villagers, the head of a poisonous snake with wings. This is the hollow cephalic appendage, the empty head of the Fulgora latinaria. Bound in an unsealed volume, shelved in the now illustrious library of a man once committed, is a mythology of the winged serpent, but not this one. Committed to the apocal binding, an old mythology in the new world states one must have sexual intercourse immediately upon receiving the sting of this creature. You have until dawn to live, or to realize the sting is but a stylet, threatening only to saps. According to one theory, the head is not a useless and empty appendage, but serves the function of storing the sap once extracted from the tree, saving it there before digestion. The preponderance of theories, however, side with the notion that the empty and mask-like head has grown only for looks whilst the intimidation of a simulated grimace cannot be denied in theory, so far no entomologist has confirmed its protective advantage. As a point of fact, photographs of the stomach contents of birds from the Amazon, Costa Rica, and French Guiana show the insects suspended in digestive enzymes. The photograph captures what the bird has already. For a less digested view of the fulgora, the entomologist unfurls a white sheet and hangs it between two trees at night, projecting a beam of light onto it. Out of the dark, they are lured by the luminous screen. The incised smile, the real grimace you cannot see. I became very interested in the possible resonances, the possible resemblances between the technologies that I use to make my images and the process or the phenomenon of biological mimicry. So for me, what became quite exciting are these, these points of contact between the luminous screen of the 
of the projected patch of light on the wall or the backlit pixels on the various devices that, that one might see my films. This is a particularly um, interesting and strange uh, condition that we're watching the films in now because they're both delayed and they kind of stutter and the voice is a little bit muddy and they're coming through the screen rather than bouncing off of the wall. So that's something to think about. And what I became interested in is what it would mean uh, to try to address the conditions of the spectator through this supposedly far off and far away um, tropical insect which is supposed to be um, so caught up, so bound up with these um, aesthetic phenomena that are supposed to save it, but ulti ultimately encumber it. And I make my films, these strange motion pictures, with uh, they're entirely with the same uh, technology that is used to make uh, special effects or the Pixar films. So they're 3D models that have been rendered, CGI renders. And so that, um, that level of artifice, which is often um, decried by my friends and, and my, myself as what's made real movies become fake, or they're usually, it, this CGI and special effects are usually seen as not so special effects, which have ruined the cinema and ruined the seriousness of cinema. It's become by now a cliche to, to denounce the Marvel comic book or the Batman uh, type movies because they're not serious. Uh, this is a cliche among you know, people of a certain age and, and people who are involved in what should be you know, cinema proper, European and American independent cinema. And so I became very interested in use it to see if I could use the most artificial technology and the most, the most um, in some ways debased form of cinema to create an, an expression of, uh, well, as Hannah said in the beginning, the synthetic character of contemporary life. Somehow it became interesting to me that that technology would itself eventually become an authentic, if you will, an original document of unoriginality or an authentic expression of precisely the, the inauthentic character of our time. So there's a set of resemblances which I don't want to overdetermine and I don't have a strict I don't think they do have a strict mapped out nexus of relationships, but this set of resemblances is important to me between what the synthetic images that the computer makes, the, the faints or the artifices of mimicry and biology, which sometimes works to preserve the insect, sometimes makes it go extinct, and a, a longer, an older tradition of making illusory images that comes to us. This is in some way the mimetic inheritance of all artworks, even abstract artworks, seem to still radiate this faint mimetic glimmer. Um, it's so, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ursula K. Heisa, Chair of the English Department at UCLA and co-founder of the Lab for Environmental Narrative Strategies, or LENS, at UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Her research and teaching focus on contemporary narrative and the environmental humanities, environmental writing, arts, and cultures in the Americas, Germany, Japan, and Spain, literature and science, science fiction, and narrative theory. Her books include, among others, Sense of Place and Sense of Planet, The Environmental Imagination of the Global from Oxford University Press in 2008, and Imagining Extinction, The Cultural Meanings of Endangered Species from University of Chicago Press 2016, which won the 2017 Book Prize of the British Society for Literature and Science. She is co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities, editor of the series Natures, Cultures, and the Environment with Palgrave, and co-editor of the series Literature and Contemporary Thought with Rutledge. She is also producer and writer of Urban Arc Los Angeles, which is a wonderful documentary. Um, I encourage you all to see if you haven't already about the red crowned parrots of Pasadena and which was created as a collaboration of Lens with the public television station KCET Link. Thank you for inviting me, pleasure to be here. Um, and um, so my main area of research and expertise is narrative. So my main interest is in you know, what stories are, how they work, 
by whom they're created um, and who listens to, reads or watches them. And so my research over the last decade has focused on the stories that surround endangered and extinct species. And yeah, there's three big questions that arise when you look at the issue of biodiversity loss and species extinction from the point of view of narrative. So one is the question of what story scientists tell about how biodiversity is currently changing and how these stories are translated into cultural artifacts and stories. The second one is the question of what narrative templates shape these stories about endangered and extinct species in particular cultural communities. And third, um, I've been interested in, in figuring out how we talk about global changes in biodiversity. I mean, species loss is a worldwide phenomenon through a focus uh, usually on particular species that then work as proxies for the larger crisis. So that relationship between individual species and the, um, and, the, uh, and, and the worldwide crisis between the local and the global is sort of a third question. And you'll see how these three, um, how these three questions really weave through my talk. Now, extinction of non-human species hasn't always been a concern, uh, either in terms of science or in terms of culture. In Western cultures, the, and you may already know this, the dominant belief, of course, until the early 19th century was that God had created animals and plants and that he wouldn't just let species vanish. Um, it took the discovery of deep geological time and then also the discovery that some fossils just couldn't be matched to anything in the 19th century world. Um, and finally, Darwinian evolution theory, which, um, which Jeffrey has so eloquently invoked, to gradually persuade authorities and the public in the 19th century that indeed species could go extinct. Um, in fact, of course, Darwin's theory assumes that species go extinct all the time as better adapted species arise. But extinction was still culturally assumed to be mostly a thing of the past until the late 19th century. Um, when the near extinction of the bison and the extinction of the, the passenger pigeon, which had existed um, in the uh, millions in the United States, um, led to people's realization that extinction was also happening in the contemporary era. And that then led to the creation of the first conservation associations in Europe and the United States and throughout the 20th century. Um, so, um, but um, throughout that time, mostly, um, conservation actions focused on individual species that were thought to be at risk. Um, now that scenario really, really changed in the 1970s and 80s. So that was when paleobiologists like David Raup and Jack Sapkowski uh, argued that actually gradual biological evolution was a lot, what was um, a lot less shaped by these step-by-step -step extinctions than by mass extinctions. So mass extinctions are really different. Um, they are events during which 70 or more uh, percent of existing species go extinct in a relatively short time. Um, so what, what's the difference between normal extinctions and mass extinctions? Well, um, really adaptation doesn't play a huge role in mass extinctions. Mass extinctions wipe out a majority of existing species regardless of how well adapted to their environments might be. And we know of only five of these mass extinctions that have taken place in the three and a half billion years of biological life on earth. Um, so this insight and the fear that we might be going through yet another mass extinction led um, environmentalists um, like Norman Myers, Paul and Ann Ehrlich and E.O. Wilson um, led them to make it public that we might be facing um, a gigantic biological crisis, this time triggered by humans. And that then led to the rise of the term biodiversity um, as a watchword of environmentalism in the 1980s um, and to the concern with mass extinction as opposed to just extinction of individual species as a real hallmark of environmental movements, um, especially in the global north, but not only. Um, currently, and this is part of what got me interested in researching extinction narratives, um, endangered and extinct species are culturally um, ubiquitous. And you find them in a lot of different shapes um, and a lot of different contexts. So you walk into a Whole Foods and you'll see them on chocolate wrappers. You walk into a toy store or a museum and you'll see these uh, you know, incredibly cute 
um, reproductions of endangered animals or in some cases extinct ones. Um, you'll find them in beautiful um, decorative carved sets um, of species um, that you can give as gift items. And um, I found these at a, at a Muji store in Hong Kong in like 2010 as like a, um, it was like one of their pre-Christmas things, one of the things that you can give to people for Christmas. And I thought, oh, well, that makes a cheery, you know, Christmas gift. Let's remind people of how many species humans have driven to extinction. Um, not dinosaurs, but, but you know, um, uh, for animals for whose extinction humans are responsible. And of course, you know, the images on um, many of the calendars and other materials that environmental organizations um, send out every year um, feature um, endangered species all the time. Um, so that's sort of the general scenario by which we are surrounded on a daily basis. And then that goes along with just a profusion of nonfiction books um, novels, poems, documentary films, photographs, websites, and even musical compositions. And I've just, on this slide, I've just put a bunch of the nonfiction books. It's just a small fraction of what's out there. And there's more books coming out about this every, every year. Um, and, um, you know, and they, they include, um, and this, these are some of the books across different languages that deal with individual species in a, in a, um, in a fictional mode. Um, there's, that includes now three books that are called the, the Sixth Extinction, by which they mean the Sixth Mass Extinction, of course. Um, and so the question that arose for me from this really vast archive of recent texts and films and photographs and so forth is why do we care so much about endangered species and especially about endangered and extinct animals? They're almost always animals. Plants just don't get um, anything like the same kind of attention, even though they're, of course, no less affected by extinction. So which of these species do we know about? Which ones do we care about? And which ones do we ignore? And why do we seem to have this compulsion to keep writing about these species and filming and photographing and making um, some sort of replica of them? So that question of um, why do we care became the um, uh, the inspiration for the book that Hannah mentioned in her introduction, Imagining Extinction, um, and, um, and um, became the core of my research for quite a few years. So a lot of the books by scientists, activists, and writers on the current extinction crisis say that we should care about endangered species and that we should care more than we currently already do and that we shouldn't just care in the abstract, but that we should go out and take action. And they could give a lot of reasons from scientific to ethical, cultural, and aesthetic ones why this would be a good idea. And I mean, that's clearly a very important argument um, and, and an urgent one, and it's one that I agree with. But my, mo my own interest wasn't actually so much to encourage people to care um, as in asking why so many people and institutions, countries, and organizations obviously already care so much that they produce all these books and films and toys. There may be any number of reasons why individuals come to engage with one or the other endangered species. Um, that, that's without question, and that's sort of a question of individual biography and psychology. But what, what is it that makes these stories interesting to a broad audience, to a really large public? What makes them issues of collective and public concern? And how, how do these narratives make the connection between the history and identity of particular communities and then a broader understanding of um, how species are changing and which ones are disappearing in the current period? So the main way in which these narratives tie individual local places to that broad scenario is by way of um, a proxy logic or you know if you're in literature you might recognize the term what we would call a logic of synecdoche so what does that mean well it means that charismatic megafauna so first of all animals secondly vertebrates and mostly mammals and birds are taken as a shorthand for all species um, and these species then serve as proxies for ecosystems and for biodiversity at large. And biodiversity itself sort of becomes a measure for what we value about nature and more indirectly what we also value about ourselves. So biodiversity loss then comes to be felt and understood 
as a sign of something that we lost in the course of modernization or colonization. And by we here, I mean, in some cases national, in other cases regional, or in other cases local or indigenous communities in different contexts. Um, so for these, for these communities, the endangered or extinct animal becomes a way of remembering and mourning what they think they've lost and of thinking about our own collective identity in a context that was radically changed by modernization or colonization or both. Um, so, um, uh, so there's nothing in principle wrong with interpreting observations about natural change in that way, um, either scientifically or culturally. But I think it's important to uh, remain aware of the substitutions that we make along the way and that they evolve, what they involve at each step. And this is important so that you don't come out at the end um, with a story that appears falsely inevitable. It's one possible story that we can tell about um, about how biodiversity is changing. And once you take into account other measures, other proxies, other substitutions, it opens up the possibility of telling different stories about how biodiversity is currently changing and how our communities are changing. Um, so two of the story templates, the, the story genres that I found most often in extinction stories across different media and to some extent across cultures were elegy and tragedy. And these genres resonate to varying degrees in stories about, say, the Bengal tiger or the panda, which are very powerful proxies for national identity in India and China. Um, or you see that at the, uh, at the bottom left of the um, slide in Australian stories about the thylacine, um, which was willfully hunted to extinction during the settling of Tasmania in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, or in American stories about the, about the demise of the passenger pigeon. Um, so the passenger pigeon existed in the billions, as I've mentioned, in the 19th century and was imagined to be, is imagined still to be associated with a bountiful nature that we think existed in the 19th century. And, you know, that was a time when the United States liked to call itself nature's nation, right? And these stories come out, also come up in conflicts over indigenous and modern traditions um, related to, for example, the hunting of gray whales. Um, and who should be allowed to hunt them and why and in what numbers. So what I found again and again, and that's sort of the meaning of this little um, schematic representation of, a, of the argument that, that I make in the book is really that the stories about endangered species can't be dissociated from stories about cultural identity. Um, and more precisely what I mean by that is sort of stories about what kind of nature we think existed in our past. These stories aren't always scientifically accurate, but they're nevertheless culturally really important. Um, what kind of nature we want now and what kind of nature we want in the future and what we want ourselves to be in that nature. And they're also entangled with questions of justice, um, questions of what it's right to do by other people and what it's right to do by other species and what you do when different communities have very different ideas about what that kind of justice should be. Um, so in a nutshell, um, the main argument of the book Imagining Extinction that Hannah mentioned is that, you know, what we usually talk about biodiver as biodiversity conservation would actually be better addressed as questions of multi-species justice. So what I mean by that is that I think questions of, of change in biodiversity and loss in biodiversity um, they're not at their core questions of biological and ecological science, although these are, of course, very important. Um, at bottom, they're stories about cultural identity, about what we value and what we don't value in people and other species and in nature. Um, so let me explain that a little bit more. Let me explain what I mean by multi-species justice. Um, so multi-species justice really builds on the theories and activism of the environmental justice movement. Um, so one route for the environmental justice movement is, um, is writings and activism about environmental racism in the United States starting in the 1980s. The realization that um, poor communities and communities of color were more exposed to risks, technological and ecological risks like toxic waste dumps, toxic industries and so forth and had less access to the benefits of nature. So less access to green spaces, less access to clean water and clean air and so forth. Um, 
So that was a movement that took off in the 1980s and really started to link in a, in a new way it, the struggle for social justice with the struggle for environmental conservation. The other route for the environmental justice movement as it exists today is what, um, what some activists and some um, scholars call the environmentalism of the poor. So movements in the global south where local communities fought against dams or fought against deforestation or fought against pollution at the hands of corporations and over the right to live in a clean environment and to maintain control over their resources. Um, so multi-species justice builds on the insights, both the theories which are by now quite developed and then you know, the act, act, activism of the um, environmental justice movement. Um, but what it tries to do is to expand the idea of environmental justice beyond humans. Um, and so in doing that, it's a little bit tricky because theories of justice usually only refer to justice among humans. And they traditionally up until the 1990s didn't really allow for, for non-human agents to be included under what we, what we understand as justice. So, um, so in integrating um, non-humans, I found really useful sort of a new branch of anthropology that's emerged over the last 10 years called multi-species ethnography. And what multi-species ethnographers do is they come and study what we usually think of as human cultures and human societies as in reality cultures and societies that are made up of many species. I mean, as you all know, um, our bodies are habitats for other species. There are microorganisms that live in our skin. There's um, gazillions of bacteria and microbes that live in our guts. There are the viruses and bacteria that cause us disease as we all too well know in the current circumstances. There's the animals and plants that we eat. And then there's the other animals that and plants that we keep sort of for aesthetic or company purposes. And then some of them have religious, um, religious uh, signification and, and cultural value. So, um, so what multi-species ethnographers do is really look at human societies as these aggregates of a lot of different species. And they're really interested in how these different species meet with each other and who benefits and who doesn't and what the power differentials are. And in the process, they're also really interested and in this was something that, that um, I became really passionate about um, how different communities often live differently with the same species. So there's some totally fascinating work by multi-species ethnographers in Australia about how Aboriginal and white communities both live in very close connections to dogs. Um, but how these, how that, how those connections have really been used um, at the expense of Aboriginal communities during um, the colonial expansion. So, what does multi-species justice want to do concretely? Well, on one hand, um, one complex of of issues that I've been really interested in is um, what a lot of conservationists are also um, interested in. That is, moments or sites where you have a convergence between justice for humans and justice for other species. Um, so, you know, a lot of people refer to that as what's good is good for the land or other people say what's good for the land is good for the people. So the idea that when you do something for nature and you do something for non-human species, that'll also benefit the human communities. And that is certainly true in some cases. Um, I mean, if you think of things like water or air pollution or deforestation. Yeah, if you clean up the air and water, that is good for both humans and non-humans. And preserving forests is in many cases excellent for both humans and non-humans. Um, and sometimes people try to think of environmental justice along those lines, that if you just improve nature, it'll be good for everybody. That's not what I found and that's not what other people have found. Um, and some of the, um, conflicts over conservation, especially in the global south, um, really have also turned up conflicts between justice for humans and justice for non-humans. And one particular flashpoint in a lot of the global south, particularly in Africa and Latin America and then certain parts of Asia, like in India, um, that flashpoint has been um, nor uh, conservation organizations from the global north coming in and creating national parks or wildlife refuges 
Um, and often in the 70s and 80s, local communities were not necessarily consulted um, in the process. So then you have a national park and local communities can no longer go in to hunt or gather fruit or um, log certain trees. And so often that really led to conflict between conservationists um, and local communities, sometimes indigenous ones, not always, um, because they felt that, look, uh, sorry, we've lived in this ecosystem sustainably for millennia. How dare you now come in and tell us what to do with our resources, right? Um, so that's been a conflict and it's still to a certain extent a conflict, although it's gotta be said that a lot of conservation organizations have gotten better about this. And um, you know, a lot of them now really do, um, do um, extensive uh, stakeholder consultation before undertaking any, um, any conservation projects. But still, I mean, that question of who gets to say what's good, who determines what is just, um, continues to be a really interesting problem. And then sometimes in other cases, uh, you have conflicts between the claims of different non-human species on our moral consideration. And this is uh, my favorite example is right here in Los Angeles, um, where in Los Angeles County, we have anywhere between 800,000 and 2 million feral cats. Um, so this has become a huge ecological problem because they prey on um, songbirds, they prey on lizards, they prey on rodents. Um, sometimes, although it turns out they're not as effective of taking care of the mice and rats, which we might want them to do, but they're actually very, very destructive for songbirds. And so I found myself really torn about this problem because on one hand, I am a passionate bird watcher and um, environmental advocate. So um, I'm wary of the presence of large numbers of feral cats, which we already know have wreaked havoc on native wildlife in places like Australia. On the other hand, I also understand the arguments of, um, of um, animal rights advocates who say, well, look, it's us humans who have put the cats out there, so we can't simply exterminate them. That would not be fair. Um, so I've been interested as a corollary of these interests of how environmental justice scenarios get represented in fiction. And I'm just going to give you one very brief example. Um, the Bengali novelist Amitabh Ghosh's The Hungry Tide, which came out in 2005. It's a long and complex novel. I won't talk about it in great detail, but one of the most salient um, plots in the novel revolves around an island in the Sundarbar wetlands. Um, so that's a, a mangrove wetlands on the Bay of Bengal. Um, where um, refugees from Bangladesh um, converged on a particular island in the um, early 1970s, now um, early to mid 1970s. Now in 1973, that area had been declared a reserve for tigers. And so over the years, pretensions gradually um, strengthened between these um, illegal immigrants, refugees, um, unauthorized settlers and the leftist Marxist um, Indian government at the time that was worried about uncontrolled streams of refugees and also wanted to preserve that area as, um, as a wildlife refuge. And so in 1979, uh, the police laid siege to that island, cut the population off from supplies. Um, and then after a few months went in and a total of like 4,000 people were killed either because of the famine because they could not get a hold of, gro of groceries and other supplies, or because they were killed um, during the massacre that was committed during the um, police incursion, or afterwards when they were transported to other refugee camps. So in one part of the novel, um, Ghosh makes one of the refugees um, speak, and it's a very, very, very moving passage. So Kushum, uh, the refugee says, the worst part during the siege was not the hunger or the thirst. It was to sit here helpless and listen to the policemen making their announcements, hearing them say that our lives, our existence were worth than dirt, were worth less than dirt or dust. This island has to be saved for its trees. It has to be saved for its animals. It's a part of a reserve forest. It belongs to a project to save tigers, which is paid for by people from all around the world. Every day, sitting here with hunger gnawing at our bellies, we would listen to these words over and over again. Who are these people, I wondered, who love animals so much that they're willing to kill us for them? Do they know what is being done in their name? Where do they live, these people? Do they have children? Do they have mothers, fathers? 
as I thought of these things, it seemed to me that this whole world had become a place of animals and our fault, our crime was that we were just human beings. Now, you may disagree with that final sentiment. You may say, well, but wait a minute, Kushum, you know, animals are extremely endangered and are going extinct around the world too. Um, but you see how complicated it gets and how um, this is a case where really the interests of local people and of humans conflict with the conservation of non-humans. So, and there's elaborate um, discussions in the, in the novel um, following this incident um, on the part of um, wealthy Indians, foreign conservation biologists and local people um, about the meanings of the incident and what it implies for who should have a say over what is to be done with non-human species and whether you know, they have a claim on our moral consideration and how we weigh that against the claims of poor people, of uh, communities such as refugees or just local communities who've lived in a place for many years. Um, so these are the kinds of stories that I investigated in the book. And more generally, they're the kinds of stories that, um, that we investigate at the Lab for Environmental Narrative Strategies at UCLA that, that Hannah mentioned. So we're really interested in how stories about environmental issues including, and in my case, especially biodiversity and extinction get told across different media, across different cultures um, and at different moments of history. Um, Cause we think that that's really super important for communicating between different communities over what is to be done um, with our natural environment and to form communities that go beyond cultural boundaries. And that was also a little bit the inspiration behind um, Urban Arc Los Angeles, which is a film about the red crowned parrots of Pasadena, a Mexican species that has found a home in uh, East LA and um, thrives there now, even as it's become endangered in its uh, original habitat in Mexico. So it was sort of a, a beautiful story, of, not of extinction, but of um, involuntary or unintentional on the part of humans, um, restoration that also really resonated with the other migrants who come to us from Mexico in search of habitat. Thanks so much. Just a question, I guess this, this is really for, for both of you, Jeffrey and Ursula, um, thinking about sort of both of you touched on the, almost the aestheticization of these, of non-human animals. And I'm wondering um, in a sense sort of what are the stakes of that in terms of the survival of those species, right? So if, by seeing these, these species that are perhaps endangered or not, um, or extinct as um, beautiful, interesting, cute, however we, we decide to see them, does that sort of make them more valuable or in a way are they kind of tokenized or, or almost written off in that sense? Um, so maybe this is more a question for, for Ursula, but I'd be curious to hear Jeffrey's thoughts as well, sort of thinking about um, looking deeply at um, these insects. Yeah, I have a, I, I, I'd be happy to, to give it a stab. So um, I do think it's true and it's been one of the gambits of a lot of conservation organizations to say, if we can make animals um, interesting, um, aesthetically appealing, see, make them seem cute or majestic or sublime um, or funny in some cases, um, that will help conservation. Um, and in many cases, honestly, that has worked. And that explains also why so many conservation projects focus on not, and not just conservation, but also scientific projects. Just uh, they focus disproportionately on, on mammals and birds. They focus on vertebrates. First of all, invertebrates get a lot less attention. And then among the vertebrates, um, you know, birds and mammals get by far the most attention. We're doing okay on reptiles and amphibians. Uh, fishes already, even among the vertebrates, get, get a lot less attention. Um, and so, so that's true of the science even, not just uh, of conservation. Now, the gambit that some uh, conservation organizations make is that that attracts, you know, funding for science, funding for conservation, attracts public interest, and that generally speaking, it's what people love and want to preserve that will get preserved. Um, the other gamble there is that um, in, is what a conservation organization sometimes call umbrella species. That is, if you preserve habitat for elephants, 
that will actually preserve a lot of plants and a lot of smaller animals that people may not find so interesting, including a lot of insects. And I mean, I would love to hear Jeffrey talk about insect conservation because I've been really, I've been super interested in the way in which um, butterflies are this one exception. I mean, they, they actually do get love and attention from, from a larger part of the public than other kinds of insects, which are either ignored or hated like spiders. And among butterflies in the United States, the monarch butterfly has just been phenomenal about creating this whole advocacy movement of its own. So um, I would love to, to, uh, to hear from Jeffrey sort of what, how he sees sort of the aesthetics of insects and which insects appeal and, and you know, what our emotional relation to them is. Well, this is a fascinating question and I'm, there's no way I could possibly answer it exhaustively, but I do, the, there's a great point of connection to make back to what Professor Ursula has, has just described, which is this, um, the attempt to make certain species more photogenic or telegenic, or perhaps if we were to speak from the standpoint of nature and the, the relationship of nature to our phototechnical devices, some, the lens, as they say in Hollywood, just likes some faces better. There's a way in which, you know, could even be so simple as the structure of a certain mammal's face, or in the case of the butterfly, that patterning happens to already look like the human appropriation of butterfly patterning, pat patterning in Art Nouveau or Art Deco. There's perhaps some way in which there's this, this binding uh, between humans and animals that they admire or fear that goes back so long that what we think is distinctly human is in fact already an attempt to approximate the animal. I would say that in a very basic anthropological level. Um, and then I do think that we do have these, we have shared fascinations with the animal kingdoms because we are still ultimately part of the animal kingdom to use a, uh, an, an archaicism. And I think that one of them, one thing that I'm very interested in with butterflies, and this would only very partially answer Professor Heiss's great question and yours too, Hannah, is the role of the ocelli, the eye spot in Lepidoptery. These eye spots, which come up in the inferior wings of not a uh, Lepidoptera, but of a, a Hemiptera, a, what's called a true bug in entomology, which is what the Fulgora is, even though it looks like a butterfly, this, these eye spots are not just supposed to shock when their upper wings ascend and reveal what's under them in in the case of butterflies. They're supposed to possibly shock a predator into thinking that it is now the prey and not the predator as say a lizard approaches a butterfly and then the butterfly or the, the moth or some other beetle-like insects would engage in that fearful spasm that they do when they're trying to scare away or shock a predator. But they don't just shock, according to, to now a century or more of entomology, they're there to fascinate, they're there to beguile, to entrance, not unlike um, the, the pendulum of the hypnotist. There is an attempt there to lull us into a kind of stupor in which we can't act. One uh, French, you wouldn't call it, an amateur entomologist and a philosopher of nature and in some capacity, Roger Caillois describes this process as um, this process as akin to med the Medusan glance, the gaze of Medusa that turns its potential victims to stone. This is, as Caillois says, the role, the biological role, and of course it could only function metaphorically, but this is the biological role of the these eye spots. Eye spots patterning, camouflage in the butterfly world, they do seem to say function analogously or in parallel with I think many of the things that we do or are caught up in as human beings. And I think that might be one, one possible explanation for why human beings are so readily attached to butterflies. We have it even in our, at least in our romance languages or the languages I'm familiar with um, papillon comes from papier, so there's a 
paper pulpness to the to the very naming of the butterfly, which then goes into into German and and um, Portuguese. Or are um, there's a there's a number of in the great lepidopteral verses in in the history of literature we have great likenings between butterfly wings to the pages of the book or the pages of the of the manuscript. So in Mallarmé, there's a wonderful affinity that he draws to what he calls le papillon blanc, the white, the white butterfly. And, and if you think about the book seen down the spine, even though the butterfly is an invertebrate, it's already a kind of butterfly. I think these kind of affinities between the animal body and our already existing cultural productions, cultural acts, whether they're literary or imagistic, I think that has something for me to do with, with, the, with the excitement or the, the more ready uh, desire we have to protect butterflies. We have a question in the chat from Stacy Voss. So I will invite Stacy to ask a question if she would like to for Jeffrey. Oh, thanks so much for organizing this, um, Hannah. It's very nice to see you after a long time. Um, and it was wonderful to hear um, both of these talks together. I guess actually my question is um, related to what uh, you were just saying, Jeffrey, but I, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the connections that you're making between beauty and creativity and extinction and language. Um, so I was just wondering in, in terms of the, the writing that you did for the two films that you showed us today, if you could talk a little bit more about your own practice um, with writing and, and maybe if there's a, there's a way of thinking about the preservation of particular words or patterns of speech that you're, that you're also working into this. Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much, Stacy. One thing that I guess there's a couple ways in which writing relates to the bodies of the butterfly, both the extinction and also their biological function. One is mimicry. So we have in, you know, in, in the broad sense, the making of images in, in the, not just in a discourse or a rhetoric, but rhetoric, but in a, in a literature of which documentary voiceovers are a, a subspecies, we'll say, possibly an a, a understudied subspecies, the voiceover and documentary as literature. But one of the things I'm very interested in is the way that that voiceover can function or the writing in my text can function as a kind of mimicry of a much more serious or high funded or official or authoritative um, voiceover. So, so one thing I'm interested in is the use of um, authoritative sounding constructions that then fall apart, fizzle. I joked with Professor Heise that what I made were, weren't necessarily documentaries, but rather imploded allegories. And one of the means um, by which they, these allegories implode is that a double meaning suddenly emerges, such as in the Fulgora film that I showed first, the word sap means both, you know, an, it's an old time American expression used often in film noirs and advertisements for dummy, someone who's easily duped. But of course, it also, it also refers to the foodstuff of the, of the fulgora, and the fulgora is trying to dupe you. So it's a, it's a word that, is, that really needs to be there. It's a mot juste, as it were, but it's, um, it's also, it undermines the patent seriousness of the film. I'd say in terms of extinction, there's a, also a pressure for the serious film, the contemporary film, to be contemporary. And one thing that, that my, I think you're referring to is the way that the voiceover archives bygone expressions. And I think that the voiceover actor that I worked with, who's immensely talented and a wonderful artist in his own right, he himself is so good, he relishes in the pronunciations and in the the, the, the right sounding enunciations of these bygone expressions. I'm gonna ask a question for perhaps some of the students in my intro to cinema class. This is also for Jeffrey. Um, we were watching Daisies this week and it just struck me that there's that wonderful kind of montage of, of butterfly shots in that film. Yes. Um, and I was just curious if you could talk a bit more about some of your um, 
influences in, in as a filmmaker and in filmmaking, obviously you seem to draw from a much um, wider well than necessarily just film in your work, but who have been some of the film? The history of cinema is, is I think is, is um, where it started for me. And I think where, what, what continues to be the, the most exciting um, source of inspiration. And um, there's so many places in which cinema does border on literature, either, you know, when it comes from, from films that film uh, scripts that are written by great authors, you know, Rob Grier and last year at Marion Bad, which is something I've been watching several times through during this period of intense quarantine and isolation. Um, and it seems more like a documentary of contemporary life. Now that we've been stuck in one place, it does feel a little bit like we're in this uh, German or Czech chateau where the time keeps repeating itself. I think for me, I, I take lots of inspiration from, from different places. One major one is this flourishing in Europe after the war of a kind of documentary that doesn't, in some ways should not have been made. Money was made available to young filmmakers such as Alain René before he made something like Hiroshima Monomore. Um, he made a film called Le Chant de Styrene, which I absolutely love. It's a, it's a film he made for the aluminum uh, magnate or country, uh, company called Pechine. And um, it's a poetic documentary of what they make at this, in this case, um, vacuum formed plastic. And there's a voiceover by Raymond Cano and, and that's extraordinary. There's, um, so that's a huge inspiration. There is, um, there's a suite of documentaries that, um, that Agnès Varda made in, in the end of the 1950s that I also think are, for me, they're, they're deeply inspiring. So there's one called um, Coasting Along the Coast, which, is a, which was funded by the French, uh, the regional French travel board for the Côte d'Azur region. And it should just be reasons to go here and check it out. And it became a kind of um, cinematic philosophical meditation on what it means for humans to emerge from nature and the possibility of original sin. And it's, you know, it's shot up against um, pretty ladies eating nice food on the beach. And there's a way in which there's a discordance between what the voiceover is saying in its jolly middle-class accent and what the meaning of the words as they float over or sometimes radically fly away from the images that we're seeing. Also, the cuts are so strange and beautiful. You'll, you'll have a hard cut up against something that doesn't make any sense, or you'll have a dissolve in the middle of a long shot for no apparent reason. And this shock that one experiences, I find wonderful. When I was a child, I, I'll, I'll speed through film history for a second. When I was a child, I saw, or when a teenager, I saw Microcosmos, also made in, in French, and, and, and is a higher budget um, nature scape, but has many staged photographs, including many shots that are, that are, that have almost um, Hollywood-like lights for, for insects. There's a, a, a segment with gastropods, with snails that are mating, and it, it looks like a um, a steamy sex scene from a Hollywood movie because they, they've lit it analogously to, uh, to a, a Hollywood sex scene, but with tiny little lights, with, with microscopic lights. And, and to me, that kind of thing is, is wonderful. And the voiceover, the role of the voiceover there um, is, is just, I think, stupendous and strange and beautiful. And that was the first film that I saw that, you know, without actors, because um, CGI movies hadn't become a thing yet. A, a, a film that's just uh, taking place, the drama, principal drama is taking place through the bodies of mostly invertebrate creatures that I, I thought was, was incredible and captivating. I, I watched it over and over again. I think Microcosmos also raises a really interesting aesthetic question because it, um, I loved the film because in some sense, I mean, it was, uh, you know, trying to show the audience, an average European meadow and the incredible life forms it contains. Um, to me, it seemed like a lot of the um, caterpillars and beetles were filmed as if they were aliens. I mean, to me, it seemed like a weird kind of science fiction and it was in some sense, 
the opposite of a normal documentary film, right? Because there were no explanations of what anything was or what the eco ecological relations were. And there's a scene at the end where you just, you know, you see a water surface and then you see this sort of golden emergence and you think you're looking at like the birth of some goddess. Mm -hmm. And only when the thing takes off and makes this sound, you realize that all you've seen is the hatching of a mosquito. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's brilliant, but it raises a really interesting, a really interesting issue. So I think the, um, the, the underlying um, gist of that film is to take something that we're all familiar with, which is just, oh, you know, your average sort of meadow um, and show what amazing life forms there are in some sense making strange what, um, mm. what is there. And I saw that also in your, uh, in your film, uh, both of your films, Jeffrey, that, that there is sort of, I mean, my, my question was sort of like, okay, why, why, why film museum specimens? that you could just photograph, whereas, you know, the real, the real um, force of film would, of course, come to life if you photograph, if you film them out in the wild. Um, but it seemed to me that maybe that was part of your strategy, also a sort of certain estrangement. So I think there's always that, that tension between on, on one hand making strange and on the other hand wanting to make familiar. I mean, as an environmentalist, you also want to you know, familiarize people with what's out there. And I think both of these tendencies are there and they sometimes work together and sometimes against each other. And on one hand, you know, wanting to, um, wanting to show relations and how much something is alive. And on the other hand, wanting to show beauty and really turning things into an object. Cause I mean, I, you know, your film, I just thought it was really interesting how toward the beginning, actually at one point, that strange head was all out of focus and what was in focus was that needle with which the yeah, with which the, right. the butterfly was attached to whatever surface it's it's um, pinned to right so i thought that was i thought that was a real a real a really interesting moment because it sort of drove home to me oh this is not a live butterfly this is a museum mm -hmm. specimen so mm -hmm. i was just wondering um uh how you think about that sort of that dialectic between making strange and making familiar well, uh, it comes up I, a lot in environmental film and writing, I think. Well, I think you've just nailed it, uh, Professor Heise. For me... Pinned it, so to speak. <laughs> well, pinned it exactly. I mean, this is... So I think I do think of it precisely as a dialectic. So I think it, to the exact extent that I want to reveal something or in the, tradi in the traditional standpoint of the filmmaker who uses an audience to something, they may not have seen. There's a little bit of that even in the voiceover. You may not have seen the Fugora Latinaria, ladies and gentlemen. At the same time, I want to show it as, a, as an aesthetic object that is subjected to the, simultaneously to the process of displacement that's come from global capital or that has been um, marked with the pain of history. These, all of the insects that I've so far worked with have um, on their on their specimen cards, they detail sites of extreme colonial brutality. So not the brutality against um, natural species, but of the human. And this, there's an there's another angle from which some photographic prints I made came of this species, and they they take place at the at the penal colony that was set up on Devil's Island at the French, um, the the notorious French penal colony. Um, for example, or the, the, the brown butterflies in my, my second film are pinned to a card that has the exact location of a site uh, under the Raj of a, of a tea plantation, which is, um, you know, an absolutely shameful history. So the, this, that brutality is not just a brutality against the animal body, but a stand-in for a brutality, something I'm very fascinated about in the research you described, a stand-in for what has been lost or what has occurred to the to the human body. Um, and I keep that very much under the surface, but just under the surface in, in my work. Um, and so that's, in some ways, there's that dialectic. Let me introduce you to this butterfly, but I'm actually going to be talking to you about the history of, of the East India Trading Company. And that will be kind of floating and ready for you to, to pounce upon, especially in this era where it seems that every possible utterance is fraught and we're re-examining everything we say because of its colonial histories or histories of 
racisms or inequality, gender and class especially, um, that, that I want that voiceover to, to, to almost be full of low hanging fruit that you can pull and, and examine and think about and critique on your own terms rather than to give that to the audience, a, a script that I think they should use to critique these histories with. Um, then, then the final term for me is that I, I'm fascinated in the way that um, by making these films out of the 3D rendering technology, that I'm not capturing anything, that I'm just engaging in yet another mimetic production, that all I'm doing is, is continuing what's already this faint or this mimicry or this, this camouflage that's already happening on the insect body. So if the Fulgora latinaria has evolved this absurd protuberance that looks a little bit like a miniature alligator head, then my film is an, a, a kind of absurd protuberance of a film. It's pretending to be a film, something captured with prestigious lenses and cameras in a prestigious university's co entomological collection. But for me, none of these things exist. Um, I didn't have a camera and I didn't have a single insect. It was all drawn on the computer and then, and then rendered out as footage that was then encoded as video. So the, this mimetic duplication continues into the condition of reception for the spectator. And this lack of certainty about whether or not you're, what you're looking at is indeed what you're looking at or what you're looking at is indeed what the narrator is saying you're looking at, that instability is a space of excitement or intrigue or fascination for me. And it's a way of trying to address the condition of the spectator in a place like an art museum or an art gallery. Thank you so much both for your fascinating presentations and for the conversation today.